everybody. Welcome to BioSC 140 Human Physiology. This is Section 1, Part 3, System Examples and Homeostasis Lecture. This is for Lecture Exam 1. All right, so let's get into it. Basically, for, for this, let's start with the digestive tract. So the primary function of the GI tract, let's look at some, some different names first. So digestive tract is a functional name. It's also known as the GI tract or the gastrointestinal tract. Gastro meaning stomach, intestinal, intestines. The primary function of it is to move nutrients, water, and electrolytes from your external environment to your internal environment. The job of your GI system is to turn things that are not you into you. Its job is to turn broccoli from broccoli into a part of you. And this requires the coordination of four basic processes to maintain digestive homeostasis that must work together for normal function. So in order for the stable internal environment to maintain within your body, you need to be able to bring nutrients into your body and you need to be able to eliminate waste products from your body. The four basic processes for your digestive system, for your GI system, is our digestion, absorption, motility, and secretion. One second, I'm gonna close the door. It's kind of loud outside. All right. So, in order to have a proper functioning GI system, you need to have these four activities, these four processes going on. And just a heads up, these four processes they don't just happen, like digestion doesn't happen just in one spot. Absorption doesn't just happen in one spot. There's variation throughout the whole system. There, this, this stuff shows up in multiple spots. But these are just four processes that you'll see throughout the, the whole system. All right, so let's move on. Let's look at digestion first. Let's look at digestion. So digestion refers to the breakdown of food. So, broccoli. Can you uh, directly absorb an entire head of broccoli into your body? No. You, you can't place a, an entire head of broccoli in your intestine and just absorb it through your intestinal wall. That's not how it works. You have to do digestion. You have to break that head of broccoli down into tinier and tinier and tinier pieces until you get to those biomolecules that we talked about last lecture. Those tiny proteins and lipids and carbohydrates, uh, nucleic acids, you need to break that broccoli down into its individual building blocks in order for it to be absorbed into your body. And that process of breaking it down, that process of digestion begins in your mouth and there's two main categories two main classes of digestion of breaking your food down one which i think the majority of the population thinks about when it thinks about breaking food down is mechanical it's chewing it's using your teeth to turn that broccoli into smaller bits of broccoli it's through chewing chewing is a physical process it's a physical process it's a mechanical process. Chewing is a mechanical process. Chemical digestion also begins in your mouth. So chemical digestion, I guess it could be broken down into two forms. One form would be enzymatic. So using enzymes to, to break chemical bonds and break macromolecules into tinier and tinier molecules using enzymes to break polymers. Uh, polymers into smaller, more like dimers and monomers, uh, and also acid, like stomach acid. It's not enzymatic, but it still helps break down uh, food. So 
chemical. Chemical breakdown starts in your mouth with salivary amylase. You have enzymes in your saliva that helps break down the connections between different, um, between carbohydrates, between the, the sh simple sugars within carbohydrates. You've got salivary amylase, which is an enzyme that starts the breakdown process, the digestion process. Then, you know, your food's gonna end up in your stomach. In your stomach, you have stomach acid, which is gonna further break down break bonds in your broccoli and the food that you're eating and make it into smaller and smaller pieces. And you also have enzymes in your stomach, which are going to further the process of breaking your food down. Uh, we'll talk about pepsin later on in this class. Pepsin is an enzyme that breaks um, peptide bonds. It breaks down bonds uh, in between amino acids. So it makes long, you know, basically turn proteins into simple amino acids in your stomach. So chemical. Um, for the test, I want you to understand and I want you to remember all four of these basic processes and I want you to be able to give examples of each. Give examples of each. Um, know it at that level. Absorption. Absorption is very important. It, it's bringing things that are not you into your body, absorbing them into your body and making them part of you. And most absorption, the absorption that the general public is aware of happens uh, with water solid molecules. So you've got, you're in your intestines and you've got monomers, you've got tiny organic molecules and you wanna bring those things into your body. Well, it's going to happen differently for water-soluble and fat-soluble materials. I always ask questions about this. Be ready for it. Water-soluble and fat-soluble materials get absorbed into your body differently. The difference is water-soluble materials move into capillaries. They move into your bloodstream. So... Polar and nonpolar materials do not mix well. Water is polar, fat is nonpolar. They don't mix well. It's like water and oil. They don't mix well. And it, so it kind of makes sense that you, you, when you absorb water soluble materials, when you absorb polar materials, you absorb them into a watery environment that is your circulatory system into these capillary beds right, in, right through here. Fat-soluble materials get absorbed a little bit differently. They get absorbed into what's called the lacteal. The lacteal is a part of your lymphatic system. This green tube right here, the lacteal, listed right there, lacteal. Certain small molecules, um, some molecules, some things that we digest, that we, that we absorb, they need a little extra help moving across this barrier from the inside of our intestine or the lumen of our intestine into our bodies. Vitamin B12 is one example of a molecule that needs a little extra help going from the lumen of our intestines into our bodies. The vitamin B12 is also called cobalium. Um, if you do not have enough vitamin B12 in your bodies, if you're deficient in vitamin B12, it causes something called pernicious anemia. And it's, it's a big deal. And it's, it's not a good thing to have pernicious anemia. Uh, we'll talk a lot about vitamin B12 actually throughout the, the semester because it comes up a number of times. It's on this slide because vitamin B12 needs a little extra help being absorbed in your intestines. It needs something called intrinsic factor. And if there's no intrinsic factor in the lumen of your sub, no intrinsic factor in the area, then you are unable to absorb vitamin B12. So there's a few things that are like this. Uh, vitamin B12 is our example. Uh, it needs a co-transport, something that helps it transport it from the lumen of our intestines into our bodies, vitamin B12 and 
Um, vitamin B12. I think that's all I wanted. Perfect. Yeah, it needs intrinsic factor to be absorbed. Perfect. All right, moving on to calcium and iron. So we're going to talk a lot about calcium in the following few slides. Um, calcium and iron are both things that are required for life. You know, we need calcium for the function of our muscles, for function of a lot of things within our body. We need iron for hemoglobin, for moving oxygen throughout our bodies. And our bodies have the ability to regulate how much calcium and how much iron we absorb into our bodies. So down here, we see two situations. We see one situation where there's low hepcidin. Hepcidin is a hormone. Hepcidin, low hepcidin, we see that iron is able to move into this cell, this is an intestinal cell, and then out the other side into our plasma. Out the other side into our plasma. So low hepcidin, iron moves from the lumen of our intestine into our epithelial cells in our intestine and through an iron transporter into our circulatory system. When hepcidin is present, when there's a lot of hepcidin present, iron gets absorbed into our epithelial cells, but it stays there. It gets blocked because hepcidin blocks the transporter that transports it into our plasma. So hepcidin prevents iron from being absorbed into our bodies. So reason why they're on here, some molecules, our bodies are able to regulate how much we bring in and how much we don't bring in. Um, do you know hepcidin and how it's related to iron uptake? Motility. So motility is another one of the main processes that needs to occur in our digestive tract. So there's some big issues that come into play, some big unfortunate pathologies that come into play when motility within our digestive tract does not function properly. So a few examples of motility in our digestive tract, well, swallowing. Swallowing is what most people are going to think about when they think about motility within the digestive tract. You've got to move your food from your mouth down your esophagus and into your stomach. Defecation is probably the other thing that most people will think about when they think about things moving through your D, uh, GI tract. Peristalsis. So peristalsis, I wish this was underlined and bolded. Um, I ha I've asked a lot of questions in the past about peristalsis. So peristalsis is a constriction of the smooth muscle within your GI tract. So you can see the example down here, down here in this photo that I'm circling right now. So we have this ball of food. A ball of food is called a bolus. That's a good word to know, bolus. You know what, make that a vocab word. I'm officially making bolus a vocab word. So underline it, bold it, circle it, bolus. A bolus is a ball of food that's, that, that's been chewed. Like you chew food and you swallow it, the name of it is bolus. Um, you will encounter that in your professional careers, most of you, a lot of you. So you swallow the food, and now how is it going to get down into your stomach? Well, it's not just gravity working for you. You have something called a peristaltic wave. Basically, your esophagus is going to contract behind the bolus of food, and this contraction is going to move down the esophagus in a wave-like manner that's going to push the food forward. So you can think of it as uh, a toothpaste tube. When you want to put toothpaste in your toothbrush, you start at the bottom of the tube and you kind of scrunch it up. It's, oh, let me go, let me go demonstrate. Let me grab it. So right here, if you're able to see this tiny screen, I have a thing of toothpaste. A peristaltic wave would be analogous to me squeezing the bottom of the tube 
and sliding my fingers up. It's, it's a contraction that moves in like a wave-like manner that's gonna push this food forward. That's called peristalsis. Um, there's actually another type of peristalsis that occurs in your intestines and in your stomach sometimes uh, called segmental peristalsis. And segmental peristalsis, its job is actually just to mix up all the liquid, mix up all the fluid that's within your, uh, in the lumen of your GI tract. So some peristaltic waves push food forward. Uh, segmental peristalsis, it mixes food. It's like my wife. So my wife, when she gets uh, toothpaste out of her toothpaste tube, she just like squeezes it right here and then squeezes it right here then squeezes it right here. It's not really like a, it's not like a wave-like manner. It's like a contraction in this part, then it relaxes, then a contraction down here, then it relaxes, then a contraction right here, and it relaxes. Um, it's designed to not push the food forward, but to just mix the food up. And now why would you want to mix the food up? Well, for enzymes to catalyze reactions, they have to come in contact with things. Mixing food up allows for that, that contact, that physical contact with the enzyme to allow digestion to happen. In order for something to be absorbed, it needs to physically contact the epithelial cells of your intestine. Mixing the food allows for those things to get mixed up and for contact to occur. Secretions. So secretions happen throughout your GI tract. Lots of different secretions. There's hormonal secretions. There's enzymatic secretions like salivary amylase or pepsin that we've already talked about. Mucus. Mucus is a very important secretion in our uh, digestive tract. And there's a, there's a really common, really prevalent uh, path, pathologies, pathological states that occur when not enough mucus is produced or abnormal mucus is produced in our bodies. Um, what's the purpose of mucus in our GI tract? You know, maybe some lubricating effect when we swallow, but really mucus protects our GI tract. Inside of our GI tract, we have enzymes that are designed to break bonds in organic matter. We are made up of organic matter. And we've got these enzymes that destroy organic matter within our GI tract. That sounds kind of scary, right? You know, like pepsin is designed to destroy peptide bonds and proteins. We need peptide bonds in our proteins. Yet we've got pepsin within our stomach. Mucus performs a barrier that protects our body from those enzymes. We've got acid in our stomachs. Do we want all that acid floating around our body or coming in contact with our cells? No. Mucus forms a barrier. When you don't have enough mucus in certain parts of your stomach, you can get ulcers and all sorts of bad things. Bile. So bile is a very important secretion within our GI tract. So we already talked some, we already covered some about how water-soluble materials and fat-soluble materials are absorbed into different, different things. And it's because water and fat don't mix well. Well, when you eat your avocado, you know, avocado has good fats, right? Bile helps make fats, helps make non-polar materials more soluble in our aqueous tube, digestive tube. Bile helps emulsify fats. It helps make fats within our digestive tube, helps make them dissolve better, helps make them mix better with water. Um, pancreatines help break things down also. They're digestive hormones and, and there's also um, there's digestive enzymes produced by the pancreas, but also things like insulin is produced by 
of the pancreas. So lots of secretions, lots of secretions. All right, moving on. So here's an example of a homeostatic feedback loop. So you should all be familiar with set point. You should all be familiar with uh, antagonistic control. You should all be familiar uh, with dynamic equilibrium. And we're going to look at a specific example of all that now and how it's controlled. We're going to look at calcium levels. So calcium levels in our blood. Phosphate's on here because phosphate's regulated in a very similar way. So calcium. We have an ideal amount of calcium, an ideal level of calcium for our blood. If for any reason that calcium level increases, our body needs to be able to bring that level back down to where we want it to be. So let's take a hypothetical situation where our calcium levels increase. Well, our thyroid is going to detect that increase in calcium concentration. And it's going to release a molecule, a hormone called calcitonin. Calcium levels increase, thyroid detects it, calcitonin is released. Calcitonin is going to go to three different places in order to lower our calcium levels. It's gonna to go to our bones and it's gonna tell our bones, hey bones, we've got too much calcium. How about we store some for later? Bones are a major store for, for calcium. It's like, it's like putting it in your closet for later. It's like, yeah, just sit, putting it in the bank for later. Cal, um, bones are the bank for calcium. So calcitonin's gonna say, hey bones, I wanna put more calcium into storage. And the bones gonna say, okay, we're gonna put more calcium into storage to lower our calcium levels in our blood. Calcitonin is then gonna to go to our intestines. And it's gonna say, hey intestines, we've already got plenty of calcium. We don't need any more. Can you please decrease the amount of calcium that you let into our bodies? And the intestines are gonna say, okay. Then calcitonin is gonna to go to our kidneys. And it's gonna say, hey kidneys, we have plenty of calcium. Any calcium that you put into our urine, can you please just leave it in our urine so it gets, you know, gets urinated out to reduce the amount of calcium that we have in our bodies? And the kidneys are gonna say, hey, okay, I'm on it. And then calcium levels are gonna decrease because of these three functions. Now, let's look at the opposite. Let's see what happens when calcium levels decrease. Well, when calcium levels decrease, our parathyroid, our parathyroid hormone is gonna be released. Our thyroid's gonna detect, it's gonna release parathyroid hormone or PTH, PTH. Parathyroid hormone is gonna to go to our bones and say, hey, bones, remember how we put a whole bunch of calcium into storage? Well, we need it now, we're low on calcium. Can you please release some calcium? And the bones are gonna release calcium into our bloodstream. Parathyroid hormone's gonna to go to our intestines, say, hey, intestines, we need more calcium. Can you please absorb all the calcium you can? And so the intestines will say, okay, we're gonna absorb all the calcium we can. And then it's gonna to go to our kidneys and say, hey, kidneys, we need all the calcium we can. Can you please not pee out so much calcium? And the kidney's gonna say, all right, I got you. And then calcium levels are going to increase. This is an example of bidirectional negative feedback, of antagonistic control. This is an example of homeostasis. This is an example of maintaining a variable at a set point, having dynamic equilibrium around that set point. Be able to tell this story for the exam. Know the hormones, know the places that can, the way that you affect change, the mechanisms for affecting change. Calcium distribution throughout our body, the vast majority of calcium is in our bones, 99%. There's about 1% within our cells and about 0.1%, a very small amount, within blood and in extracellular fluid. Um, I usually ask about one question on 
on this slide on the exam. Fluxes in calcium and phosphate. Fluxes in calcium and phosphate are controlled in three major areas. So this just touches on that loop that we just went over. And you know, we talked about calcium, but phosphate is controlled in a very similar way. Uh, phosphate and calcium, if your body wants to control the levels of it, it's got three levers to pull or push. It's got three ways to do that. Intestines either absorb more calcium and phosphate or absorb less calcium and phosphate. Bones, this is, if you remember back to histology and anatomy, this is a slide of a, of a bone. You can put calcium and phosphate into storage in your bones, or you can take calcium and phosphate out of your bones, out of storage. And kidneys, kidneys can either urinate out more or less phosphate and calcium. Uh, parathyroid hormone and calcitonin are the two are the two uh, hormones that help regulate this. When calcium levels rise, calcitonin is released and brings it back down. When calcium levels drop, it's parathyroid hormone that affects this. Uh, vitamin D is very important in this also. Vitamin D is very important in this whole, this whole process. Uh, vitamin D kind of helps every step of the way. It helps with absorption. It helps the kidneys function and process this properly. It helps with, with bone function. Vitamin D is, it just kind of helps all of these, these processes. So it's very important. Moving on to muscles. So there are three main types of muscles, three major types of muscles. You should know all the different types and you should know where they're found. We have skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle are voluntary. You can control skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is what allows you to move. It's your biceps, your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your, you know, your triceps. That's skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle is your heart. That's it. It's your, it's your heart. And smooth muscle is going to be your hollow organs. It's going to, smooth muscle is what does peristalsis. Peristalsis is because of smooth muscle. There's also smooth mu muscle um, that is attached to hair follicles. So let's talk about skeletal muscle for, first. So you've got a few subclasses of skeletal muscle. Type one skeletal muscle is slow twitch, slow twitch muscle. Type two muscle is fast twitch muscle. So slow twitch muscle. It doesn't produce as much force, but it's much better with endurance. Fast twitch muscle produces more force, but it doesn't have the endurance. It can't produce force for such a long time. Right here on the left side of this picture, we have a marathon runner. This marathon runner, marathons takes, take hours to run. A marathon is 26 miles. This guy right here, when he works out, when he exercises, when he trains for a marathon, he's mainly focusing on training slow twitch muscles. A marathon runner is gonna focus on training slow twitch muscles. They allow him to run for a long time. This man over here is a sprinter. He's very fast but he's not able to maintain those high speeds for a long period of time. He trains his fast twitch, his type two muscles, because he wants to run really, really fast and doesn't need to run for a very long time. So he trains his fast twitch muscles. Um, as somebody who's been a swimmer, and as somebody who's you know done a lot of rock climbing in their life, in swimming, you know, Growing up, you train half the year for what's called short course or, or short distances. You train your fast twitch muscles. And at the end of the six months where you train your fast twitch muscles, you know, you're really good at sprinting. And then you switch over and you do long course or long distance swimming for the next six months. And even though you're in really good sprinting shape, 
those long distances are really tough. And then, you know, you start training for long distance. You train your, your type one. And then at the end of, you know, long course of training for long, you switch back. Yeah, so basically you, you, tr you train for what you want to be good at. You train either your slow twitch or your fast twitch. Uh, with rock climbing, there's kind of a few different types of rock climbing. Some people like to do really long routes that are like your endurance, your, your type one muscles. And some rock climbers like doing shorter routes that are require more strength, that are tougher, type two. And I can verify if you train for short routes, you can be really bad at long routes. And if you train for long routes, you tend to be really bad at short routes. Uh, your muscles adapt to the demands that you put on them. So why is there a piece of fish? Why is there a tilapia fillet on this slide? Well, let me tell you why there's a tilapia fillet on this slide. Notice the color differences. Notice how it's dark red right along the spine, more clear on the outside. So this tilapia fillet is here because it's showing you slow twitch and fast twitch. So slow twitch has a lot of mitochondria in it. Slow twitch has your actin and myosin, which generates the force, but it also has a lot of mitochondria because it needs to produce a lot of energy long term. It needs to continually replenish its ATP stores. So right along the middle of this tilapia fillet, we see a lot of the slow twitch fibers with a lot of mitochondria. Fast twitch muscles, I mean, when you're just trying to produce as much force as you can for a short period of time, you don't need, you don't want to waste space on mitochondria. So there's very few mitochondria or much fewer mitochondria in the fast twitch muscles. Uh, so there's more room for your actin, the myosin, your force generating. Uh, mechanisms. So that's why there's a tilapia muscle here. Uh, cardiac muscle, we're going to talk a lot about the heart when we do test three, um, but cardiac muscle is the name given to the muscle of the heart. And it's got its own unique characteristics, just like smooth um, skeletal muscle and smooth muscle, cardiac muscle is, is unique. Smooth muscle, so smooth muscle is involuntary. You can't think, um, oh, you know, cardiac muscle is involuntary also. You can't like think it, like beat right now, heart, beat right now, heart. You can't like think really hard and make your heart beat. Just like with smooth muscle, you know, you can't think like do peristalsis right now, small intestine, do peristalsis right now, small intestine. You can't, you can't willfully do it. It's, it's involuntary. So smooth muscle, you're going to find that in the walls of your arteries. So in the walls of your arteries, you'll find smooth muscle. We'll talk a lot about that when we talk about the cardiovascular system. You'll find smooth muscle in your hair follicles. And most of the time when people think about smooth muscle, they think about hollow organs like intestines, bladders, and uterus. There's a few different types of muscle contractions. So break the word down isotonic. That means same, iso means same a tone, same force, so constant tension. An isotonic contraction means constant tension. A muscle changes length, um, but it's got a constant amount of force. Concentric contraction means the muscle shortens during the contraction. So concentric contraction means the muscle gets shorter. So you're doing a curl. You're, you're bringing the weight up. Your muscle's getting shorter while you do it. An eccentric contraction would be like you've done your curl and now you're going to lower your hand and set the weight down on the floor or on a table. And you're not just gonna drop the weight, you're gonna slowly and controlly put the weight down. So eccentric. Um, the main thing about, that you wanna remember about these is force is being generated for both of these. During concentric contraction and eccentric contraction, force is being generated. The difference is must, the muscle is lengthening during, sorry, the muscle is shortening during concentric and the muscle is lengthening during eccentric. So force is being generated for both. 
with concentric, the muscle is shortening. With eccentric, the muscle is, is uh, lengthening. Isometric contraction. So iso is same, metric is length, constant length. Uh, muscle does not change in length, yet it develops tension. The tension developed by the muscle does not exceed the load, therefore the muscle cannot shorten. This would be the type of contraction. So imagine like a waiter walking out while carrying a plate. Their muscles are engaged. Their muscles are producing force to hold that platter of food, but that platter of food is not going up or down. It's staying in the same place. It's isometric. So let's look at these. So right here at the top, you can see the weight is going up. This is gonna be a concentric contraction. It's generating force and the bicep is getting shorter. Right here, this person is slowly, is not slowly, but putting the, putting the weight down. And they're putting the weight down in a controlled manner where the muscle is still producing force, but it's lengthening. Right here, there's no movement in the weight. There's no movement in the weight, yet the muscle is producing force. Isometric contraction here. So we've got concentric, we've got eccentric, and we've got isometric right here. Skeletal muscle metabolism and ATP. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Uh, ATP is required for muscle function. Um, I'm not gonna ask about questions on this right here. We'll get to this when we do the frog lab. Um, immunity. So lines of defense. So your immune system is very complex. It's very complex, and like any good defense, it's multi-layered. It's got multiple layers. There's, when people talk about the immune system and what protects you from foreign, from pathogens, you know, viruses, bacteria, um, parasites, and also things like, like, like dust, you know, like all the, sm all the fires we've been having recently. All that smoke, your immune system helps protect your body from those smoke particulates. There's three main kind of lines of defense when talking about the immune system. The first one's the most general. The second one is a little more specific. And the third one is very specific. Barriers at the body surface. So this is your skin, your mucous membranes. Your skin and your mucous membranes mainly. This first line of defense is very broad, very broad. Your skin's gonna keep the outside out and the inside in. It's gonna keep your bad viruses, your bad bacteria out and the good ones in. So barriers at your body surface is your most general, your first line of defense. Your second line is your non-specific responses. These are gonna be a lot of white blood cells, a lot of leukocytes, which is another name for white blood cells. Your um, phagocytes, so if you break this word down right here, phago refers to eating, and cytes means cells, so these are cells that can eat things. These are white blood cells that can eat uh, bad bacteria, bad viruses, uh, different things like that. I need to plug my computer in real quick. All right, let's get this plugged in. So your second line of defense, like I was saying, it's, it's mainly white blood cells and it's like natural killer cells, granular sites, mega, um, macrophages. It's more specific than your skin, but it's still pretty general, you know? Um, you know, macrophages, so break that word down, macrophage, big eaters. They're called big eaters. They eat a lot of things. Um, they're not super specific, but they'll gobble up the, the bad bacteria and the bad things that get into your body. The third line of defense is very specific, very, very, very specific. It's going to involve antibodies and a subset of your white blood cells called lymphocytes, your T cells and B cells. You might have heard them. 
T cells, B cells, and antibodies. Now, these are things that like vaccines. When when a vaccine trains your body to protect you against the chickenpox, vaccines train your T cells and your B cells. It trains you to produce the specific antibodies you need to fight that specific disease. The chickenpox vaccine teaches you how to fight chickenpox, nothing else. The smallpox vaccine teaches you how to fight smallpox and nothing else. The, this line of defense is very, very specific, very, very, very specific. So your lymphatic system, your lymphatic system actually plays a few different roles. So one role we've already talked about is the absorption of ingested fats through lacteals. The absorption through in, of, uh, fats through ingested fats through lacteals. Another big role is the prevention of edema through absorption of excess fluid and its return to the bloodstream. So edema is a buildup of fluid in your interstitial space, a buildup of fluid that's outside of your circulatory system and outside of your cells. Your lymphatic system helps regulate the amount of fluid that's outside your cells and outside your circulatory system, help prevent edema. It'll absorb any excess fluid in that space and return it to your bloodstream. It also helps with immunity. Lymphatic tissue filters and cleans the lymph of any debris, abnormal cells, or pathogens, and lymph tissue produce certain types of white blood cells. Lymphatic tissue helps the maturation process of certain types of white blood cells, helps them learn how to be the best white blood cell they can be. It helps the maturation process, helps them become an effective white blood cell. You can see lymphatic tissue is spread throughout your body. It's all over the place, but there's some areas with an increase amount. Your pancreas has a whole bunch. There's the inguinal lymph nodes right through here. There's a lot kind of in your armpit area, axillary lymph nodes. Uh, there's a lot in your neck and your face also. Um, next time you get sick, you know, kind of feel around in front of your ear, below your ear, and also underneath your mandible. And look for like a, a soft, tender, movable, like ball-like structure. Uh, that's a, a lymph node helping, helping you fight your infection. The integumentary system. So the integumentary system is another name for your skin. Um, I like using those words kind of back and forth. You should definitely be ready for me to use both of those words. Uh, this integumentary system or your skin. And it's got a lot of roles. Uh, most people think of your integumentary system just as keeping, you know, making the outside out and the inside in. Um, but it's got a lot of functions. And be familiar with all of these for the, uh, the test. Um, a test question I've done in the past was, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine here. I know I've asked test questions in the past where it was like list five functions of the integumentary system, list four functions of the integumentary system, list five, uh, six functions of the integumentary system. I've also done questions like which of the following are not functions of the integumentary system or which of the following are functions of the integumentary system. So be ready for those questions. Uh, maintenance of body temperature. It's a blood reservoir. Think back to our first lecture at the very beginning of this class when I talked about that jackrabbit and its ears. You can change the diameter of arterioles in the dermis to affect the amount of blood flowing to areas that lose heat readily. Also, it produces sweat. Sweat helps cool your body down. It's a physical barrier. It's a physical barrier for abrasion, heat, chemicals. It's a physical barrier against entry. Also, it produces biostatic oils. What does, I'm um, sorry, bacteriostatic. What does bacteriostatic mean? Well, let's break it down. Bacterio is bacteria. Static is like unchanging. So it produces oils 
that prevent the replication of bacteria. So it doesn't necessarily kill the bacteria, but it prevents their replication. Reduces dehydration, screens out ultraviolet UV light. Calluses develop in areas subject to friction that'll protect you. That's kind of related to abrasions up here. Allows for sensation. Allows you to feel things, heat, vibration, temperature. Uh, excretion of small, small amounts of substances immunity from specific skin cells, a synthesis of vitamin D, which we just already talked about is important for the control of calcium levels. Male reproduction. So males and females, um, there's definitely some differences in their reproduction kind of strategies and how their body you know, does reproduction, does perpetuates the species. So male reproduction, uh, the testes produce sperm. Each testes is divided into approximately 300 lobes with seminiferous tubules where sperm are formed. Once formed, sperm move to the epididymis for maturation and storage, then move to the vas deferens and the ejaculatory ducts and through the urethra. Look at this, so the main point I wanna get in this talk about reproduction is how many spots things can go wrong. It's something like one in seven to one in 11 couples have issues with fertility. Medicine, healthcare related to the reproductive system is huge business and it's a huge burden on our society. You know, one in seven to one in 11 couples have issues with fertility. That's a lot. That's a huge number. A lot of you are going to be working with patients in front of you. And with that type of prevalence, you will have a patient in front of you that has reproductive issues at some point in time in your life. Guaranteed. You might even work in a clinic that specializes in this type of medicine. We don't talk about it a lot in our society. So I, the, the actual prevalence, the actual need for this type of medicine is a lot higher than I think the general public understands. And when, when a couple has fertility issues, when a, a person has fertility issues, it's not just one thing. There's thousands of different things that could go wrong. And my main point with this talk is I just want you to see I want you to understand all the, how complicated the reproductive system is and how a problem at any one of these, you know, 100 different things might lead to some issues. So the production of sperm, each testes is divided into 300 lobes with seminiferous tubes with a super form, but there's no fertility issues. Once formed, sperm moves to epididymis for maturation and storage. If that maturation process in the epididymis is altered or, or there's not something wrong with that maturation process, infertility. And it's got to move through the vas deferens, ejaculate ducts, urethra. There's a lot of places where issues can arise. Um, semen is formed by secretions from the seminal vesicles and the prostate if those secretions are not produced correctly, it can affect the sperm's ability to perpetuate the species. Male reproductive. It starts down here, moves the epididymis, and maturation is occurring throughout this whole process. This whole process, maturation is occurring. Female reproduction. So females have 2 million immature eggs at present at birth. About 300,000 of those oocytes will be present at age seven. Only about 400 to 500 will mature in a lifetime. So compare that to males, big difference. Very, very big difference. LH is luteinizing hormone, causes ovulation. So luteinizing hormone causes ovulation, which is the release of a secondary oocyte from the ovary. So 
release of the egg from the ovary, release of the egg from the ovary. If there's an issue with LH, if there's an issue with hormones, this won't happen. If there's an issue with the release of the egg from the ovary, fertility issues. It then travels through the oviduct, the uterus. So it's released from the ovary right here. It goes into the fimbriae of the fallopian tube. It's got to move down the fallopian tube and into the uterus. So the egg needs to make that journey in order for fertility to happen. Well, what if there's an issue in the fallopian tube? Some sexually transmitted diseases can scar fallopian tubes. When the fallopian tube is scarred, it might prevent the egg from traveling down to your uterus, leading to infertility. Lots of places where things can go wrong. Lots of moving parts. So it's got to travel to the uterus. If fertilized, a zygote will implant. If not, it will come out with the menstrual flow. Only a few hundred sperm reach the upper region of the oviduct. So fertility usually actually occurs like up here. The sperm needs to go through its full maturation process through all the male anatomy. And it needs to, you know, it's going to get deposited in the vagina. It needs to, the vagina, it has fungus and bacteria that eat sperm. It's a hazardous environment. It's got to get through the cervix. The cervix, females actually have a special type of mucus at the cervix that doesn't allow sperm to pass except for when the female's ovulating. And then the mucus actually, it, the, the mucus changes at the cervix into something called spinbarctic mucus, which actually allows the sperm to pass into the uterus. And then it's got to go through that whole process. It's got to get to the egg. When it gets to the egg, there's actually a whole bunch of like dummy cells like guarding the egg around it. And the sperm's got to burrow through those extra cells and finally get to the egg. My point being, there's a huge journey that's got to go on for the gametes to meet and for a baby to be born. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And reproductive health care is big business. You're going to have patients that have issues with this, and you, there's a good likelihood that you might even be in a clinic that specifically helps people with these issues. All right, so we're going to kind of change uh, change direction now, and we're going to talk a little bit more about homeostasis. So, organisms maintain stable conditions despite fluctuating internal environments. How many chemical reactions take place within your body in a given day? The correct answer is a lot. A lot of chemical reactions are always taking place. And those chemical reactions need a very specific environment, a very specific conditions in order to happen, in order for life to happen. Homeostasis is maintaining those specific conditions so that all the chemical processes of life can, can occur. Anatomy is form, physiology is function. Homeostasis, the maintenance of a stable internal environment. A dynamic equilibrium. Remember, dynamic equilibrium means if you want your body temperature to be 37 degrees Celsius, it's never like, it doesn't stay exactly at 37 degrees Celsius. It kind of goes a little bit above, a little bit below, a little bit above, a little bit below. It stays at an equilibrium, but it's a dynamic equilibrium, a changing equilibrium. Claude Bernard, um, expect a few questions on uh, kind of the history of physiology. So Claude Bernard was the first to define the term. I don't speak French, um, so this pronunciation is going to be awful, but milieu interior, uh, now known as homeostasis. So Claude Bernard was the first to define the term. Milieu interior, now known as homeostasis. Walter Canning came a little bit later, and he coined the term homeostasis, and he also coined the term fight or flight response, which we'll talk a lot about. And he put forth the four, one second, he put forth the postulates of homeostasis. So we're going to actually learn all those. I believe it's the second test. We'll, we'll learn all his four postulates. So homeostasis is central to physiology. Four variables, some examples of variables and parameters that are homeostatically regulated in humans. 
So we've talked about body temperature a good amount. We've talked about body temperature. Uh, blood pH we've talked about, it's got an ideal level. Blood pressure, you have an ideal level of blood pressure. Glucose, you have an ideal level of blood glucose. Set point, this should be a little bit of review now because we've seen it in lab. Set point is the target value. It's the target value, it's the ideal value at that moment. Now, your body temperature, it rises during the day, it drops down a little bit at night. The set point changes, the ideal value changes. When you get a fever, body temperature also rises. Body temperature also rises when you get a fever. It's the set point changes. Um, your set point for your body temperature also changes in females during ovulation. Sperm-like cooler temperatures. Females' bodies drop during ovulation, which is the time when they can get pregnant. Dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium means parameters fluctuate within a narrow range. So it's at equilibrium, but it's dynamic. It's fluctuating right around. Blood glucose is never exactly at, or it might some point be exactly 90, but it fluctuates right around 90. Antagonistic control. Antagonistic control means you have bidirectional negative feedback. So bidirectional means two directions. Negative feedback means it opposes change. So if your body temperature starts to go up, this control, negative feedback, is going to oppose that change. It's going to bring it back down. If your body temperature goes down, Antagonistic control is going to, or negative feedback is going to oppose that change. It's going to bring it back up to the set point. And we're going to talk a lot about intrinsic controls and extrinsic controls during this class. Intrinsic controls are going to be like that party part regulating itself. It's going to be the heart regulating the heart. It's going to be the kidneys regulating kidney function. Extrinsic control is going to be some other part of your body controlling a specific part of your body. So it's going to be your nerves controlling your kidneys. It's going to be, I mean, really with intrinsic, extrinsic control, you're gonna think nerves and hormones. So neural is gonna be nerves, hormonal, hormones. Here again, another example of negative feedback. Body temperature rises, your body responds by sweating. Temperature drops back to the ideal level. Negative feedback. Glucose homeostasis. So this is similar to the homeo, uh, kind of the negative feedback that we looked at with uh, calcium control. So we have our ideal level of glucose. If our glucose levels increase, beta cells within our pancreas are going to be stimulated. Those beta cells are going to say, are going to, they're going to notice that blood sugar went up. And those beta cells are going to go, hey, this is not good for ourselves. We need to do something about this high level of glucose. Let's release insulin. Insulin is a hormone that's going to go to the bodies of our cell, and it's going to say, hey, bodies, hey, cells of our body, you should bring more glucose into, your, into yourself, into your cells because we have too much in our bloodstream. And the cells are gonna say, okay, let's bring some glucose in, let's lower our blood glucose levels. It's also gonna to go to our liver. And it's gonna say, hey liver, we've got a lot of excess glucose. Can you please store some as glycogen for later? Glycogen is a, think of a big chain of glucoses, it's like a, Big chain of glucoses that's, you know, it's like a storage molecule for glucose. So the liver is going to say, okay, we've got excess glucose. I'm going to store some for later in the form of glycogen. This is going to drop blood glucose levels back to the set point, and we're going to get back into a good homeostasis. Well, what if the opposite happens? What if our blood glucose levels drop? Well, different cells in our pancreas, the alpha cells are going to notice this change and they're going to say, hey, our glucose levels dropped. This is not okay. We need to do something about it. And the alpha cells are going to release glucagon into our blood. 
glucagon is a hormone that's gonna go to our livers. And it's gonna say, hey liver, remember all that glycogen that you made when we had a lot of blood sugar? Well, right now our blood sugar is low. Can you please break down that glycogen and release it as sugar into our bloodstream? And the liver's gonna say, oh, I've got a ton of excess glucose stored in glycogen. I'm gonna break down that glycogen into simple glucose molecules and release it into the bloodstream, and I'm gonna restore homeostasis. So blood sugar goes up, beta cells detect it, beta cells respond by releasing insulin. Insulin goes to the liver, says, hey liver, store this glucose for later as glycogen. Insulin goes to the bodies of our cells, says, hey cells, take in more glucose, blood sugar goes back down. Blood sugar drops too much. Alpha cells in our pancreas detect it. They respond by releasing glucagon. Glucagon goes to the liver, says, hey liver, I know you've got a bunch of stored up glucose in the form of glycogen. Can you please break down that glycogen and release it into the bloodstream in the form of glucose? Liver does that. It raises blood sugar. We're back in homeostasis. So there's four, we're gonna finish off this lecture with the four main themes of physiology. We're gonna be talking about these themes throughout the semester. And in fact, we've already talked about them, some of them already. So structure and function. Structure and function are highly linked. We've talked about the shape of ears. We've talked about the shape of bones and joints, knee joints. Structure and function are highly related. We're gonna talk about that as a major theme throughout the whole semester. Biological energy use. So we just talked about glucose storage. That's storing an energy molecule. We've talked about ATP, energy use. We're going to talk all about energy, um, ATP creation, so the generation of energy. Lots of biological energy use we're going to be talking about in this, uh, in this class. Communication. How many cells are there in your body? The correct answer is there's a lot of cells in your body, and you need them to function as, uh, as a team. You need them to function together in order to have a functioning human. So you need a functional integration requires information flow. Integrating the function of all of your cells requires information flow. We're gonna talk a lot about that. It's nerves, it's hormones, extrinsic and intrinsic controls. And then homeostasis. We're gonna talk about the whole semester. Homeostasis is the maintenance of an internal environment. Structure and function could be the shape of a molecule. It could be the shape of an alveoli. So um, the more surface area there is in your lungs, the faster O2 and CO2 can get in and out of your alveoli. Right here is a damaged alveoli. There's, no, there's less surface area. There's less of an ability to move oxygen and CO2 across it. And the shape of the cell. Energy use, we're gonna talk all about energy production, mitochondria for test two. Uh, communication, so these are signaling glycoproteins on a cell surface, receptors, uh, a lot of signaling that we talked about in this class, and homeostasis. So this is a good example right here of this dynamic equilibrium. So zero on this graph is the ideal level. Zero is the ideal level. If it drops down a little bit, it's going to have a negative feedback mechanism, which brings it back, brings it up, brings it down, dynamic equilibrium, negative feedback. All right, everybody, this has been BioSC 140. If you have any questions, please email me. Have a great day.